Official data shows that the highest temperature in the U.S. was recorded in 1913. Despite this, why are budgets still being allocated to combat global warming? How can New York residents initiate an investigation into the spending of public resources on this issue if the scale of the problem is not supported by the data? So, um, I, first of all, I totally agree with you. I think, let, let's put it this way. Uh, for how many years have been the, you know, the temperature measured on planet Earth? A bit over 100 years. So we don't see the real picture. We don't know how many cycles the nature has. And I think the climate probably, we do have, you know, we, the climate does changes. But does it change due to what we do? Does it change due to, you know, human behavior? Or it will change anyway. We don't know. We have no idea. Uh, so we, we, we still need to research. We still need to continue researching the climate change. And uh, I think we need to spend money on uh, researching the climate change. Um, however, you know, I'll just give you an example. So my colleague from New York State Assembly proposed the legislation to punish those uh, big companies in New York State, demanding them to pay, I think, over three billion dollars for the damage they did to, uh, to 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 New York State, to the environment, uh, without any proof that they actually did any damage to the environment. And I think that's that's a absolutely wrong doing. That's that's a wrong path. Uh, you can't just take money from the companies assuming that they uh, did some damage to the environment. Uh, this reminds me, you know, uh, time of the Russian Revolution where they took a little bit of money from the businesses, from the companies, corporations, then a little bit more of money because communists needed money. And then they just expropriated the companies. They just took those businesses and nationalize them. So we don't want this to be the path. We don't want, uh, you know, we, we all came to this country because this is a capitalist country with rights for everyone. And we don't want this country to be a socialist country one day. And sometimes this is, unfortunately, uh, this is the uh, you know the path that, that that I see. This is the path many of my colleagues wish we can go. So I'm standing here to protect us from that. Recent surveys show that many high school and university in New York are not familiar with the basics of the U.S. Constitution. What steps can be taken to improve the teaching of the Constitution and U.S. history in our schools? What are you willing to do to address this issue? Uh, that's a very new issue to me. I didn't know this issue exists, honestly. So I don't have an answer just yet to what to do with that. And uh, I, I believe uh, that in any country, I mean, if you, if, you, if you ask the school students what they know about the Constitution, I don't think they, they know anything about the Constitution. So it kind of not, it's, it's, not, su surprise, it's not surprising me. Um, but it's an interesting issue, and uh, I think uh, we should uh, deliver this information to, um, you know, to school students. Uh, we should think of how to make this information more exciting, more interesting, and um, talking about the history, um, it's, it's, it's interesting, uh, you know, the, it's interesting, the angle of the, um, of the topic that, that, that we're teaching our kids. For example, you, you, you might heard about it, that one of the, one of the schools uh, showed kid, kids a map of the world 
without Israel on it. And it was like a part of a geography or history lesson. This is something absolutely unacceptable. Uh, but again, we all know that uh, countries like Qatar donate a lot of money to uh, American schools and uh, universities. We should, you know, we shouldn't uh, uh, exchange this money for false history or false knowledge or fake, you know, map, uh, world map. That's, I think that's absolutely unacceptable. We are, I, I think we can uh, budget our schools ourselves without the help of other countries because they always demand something in return. I don't think this is, this is a good idea. How do you assess the current state of the election oversight system in New York? Does it require reform? Um, I think it would be great to have more transparency uh, to oversee the election process, uh, definitely. So, it's a lack of transparency. Uh, there's so many, you know, details that we don't know about. We have no idea uh, how the system works from the inside. So, um, I, I would like it to be like, you know, like covered with glass so we can see the mechanism inside, the engine inside, and see all the problems and the issues. Uh, but overall, I mean, comparing to many, many other countries, or say Russia, where I came from, I think it's not the worst system in the world. But any system needs some maintenance, some oil, so it could continue, um, so the mechanism is continue working. So I think the answer is more transparency. In light of the discussions about extending voting to multiple days, what is your position on returning to single-day voting? How do you plan to protect voters' rights in this context? Well, the, the, the problem is, with one-day uh, one voting, the problem is that uh, there's so many people cannot vote because they're not in town, they got sick, and many, many, they, they're busy at work, there are many, many other reasons. So, there are a lot of benefits of early voting. Uh, however, as, as you mentioned, there are, you know, there are issues as well. And we, we shouldn't put it this way, that we cannot control it. We should control it. So early voting is good, but we should um, find a way to control early voting. If we can control one day, why can't we control seven days? How are you preparing for the upcoming elections? What steps are you taking to mobilize voters and engage with the residents of your district? You know, I'll, I'll tell you honestly, um, I'm engaging with the voters in the district regardless of the, uh, every single day. I know their needs, I know their problems. I'm receiving numerous complaints, my office is receiving numerous complaints every single day. Uh, sometimes we even work weekends. Uh, so, and I'm not doing it because, you know, to win the election. I'm doing it because I really want to help the, uh, the district. I want to help um, people who need my help. And I think this is kind of something that automatically wins you the election. So, don't think about winning the election. Think about doing your job honestly. Uh, and you, you will win the election anyway, just because, you know, people see what you do. So don't be a fake politician and you will win the election. As easy as that. What is being done to address the rising cost of housing in New York City? Are there any new initiatives to create more affordable housing or protect tenants from skyrocketing rents? So, um, nothing much was done, unfortunately. Again, because we are, uh, don't forget that uh, we have a super majority, democratic super majority in New York State Assembly. 
So any good ideas that we propose uh, are being blocked by the Democratic supermajority. We, I mean, you know, Republicans and conservatives. I believe there are too many obstacles. For example, I, I can give you a real example. For example, uh, a friend of mine, he is a, uh, he has a construction company, and he bought two pieces of land, two lots, where right? he wanted to, to, to build a building. And there was a Con Edison electric pole uh, between the lands. So he needs to remove the pole to a different location nearby. So imagine how many months do you need to remove one electric pole and start building the building which is so needed in, in the area, in the district. Guess what? Two years. Two years to remove one electric pole. So how can we build? Look at Florida, look at Texas. I mean, Florida is building towns while we are building buildings. And this is the biggest problem, the obstacle that the city and state creates for uh, private companies to build something. Once we will get rid of these obstacles, of this bureaucracy, we will build more, much more, much more housing, including affordable housing. So this will be my answer. New York City is known for its sanctuary city policies. How do you see the future of these policies, and what additional support is being provided to immigrant communities? If the state spent 2.3 or 2.4 billion dollars on migrants, uh, it's more than we spend on our veterans. It's um, <laughs> one of my followers on uh, Facebook uh, wrote when I when I was talking about migrant crisis. Uh, she wrote, "You know what? I want to be a migrant too because they're receiving much more <laughs> than the Americans." And this is a very sad truth. Um, we have so many people in need, people who are citizens of this country, and we're not able to help them. So why in this world are we spending so much money on migrants? I'm an immigrant myself. I came from the former Soviet Union. My family came from the former Soviet Union. But we were not illegal migrants. We were legal immigrants and our health was checked, our background was checked. Um, we didn't receive much help from the government. Uh, we somehow managed to found ourselves. We weren't placed in hotels. We you know, somehow managed to find ourselves uh, apartments and, and jobs. And those migrants don't want to do that. Uh, also, don't forget that it was our dream to get to this country. It's not a dream for them. They're basically coming here to make majority of them. To make some money and send the money back home or leave. Uh, so it's a constant flow of uh, people who are just using us. Also, we have no idea who they are. Uh, some of them are members of gangs. Some of them are members of terrorist organizations. We have absolutely no idea who, who these people are. Uh, just recently, in uh, there was a study that uh, in Midtown Manhattan, 75% of arrests are migrant arrests. Uh, when I heard um, uh, that Governor Hochul wants to hire migrants to work for New York State. I thought, wow, so now we will have people without background checked, uh, members of gang organizations, of terrorist organizations, working for the New York State. So I came out with the legislation that prohibits uh, gang members and terrorist organizations members to be hired by the state. 
But guess what? The Democratic majority didn't even let this legislation to the floor to vote. It was blocked. So, um, it's, it's, a, it's one of the biggest problems that we have. Another, another example, um, we asked the city, the city of New York, if they have, if, if there are any migrant shelters in my district. They said no. And then we discovered a uh, so-called hidden uh, uh, um, secret shelter on uh, East 18th Street and Morris Avenue in a brand new sleep-in hotel. And uh, my district needs hotels because a lot of people are coming here, uh, a lot of relatives, a lot of you know people need place to to spend a night or two. And it's packed uh, with migrants, so the regular constituents they just cannot use these hotels. Um, and there, there's so many complaints uh, about the migrants being loud, about knocking the doors and asking for money, about driving uh, mopeds and bikes without plates, which is like if this bike hits you, you don't get any compensation because then I have insurance. No plates, no insurance. So there are many, many, many issues and problems uh, with that. And the answer is very clear. Close the borders. It's very, very simple and clear. It's not as simple as it sounds to close the borders, but there should be a political willing to close the borders. And this is why I'm voting for Trump, and this is why I think any common sense person today would vote for Trump. I know a lot of people like, don't like Trump, don't like his personality. It's not a matter of liking him or disliking him. It's a matter of job done. And I think this man will make the job done. He will close the borders. Homelessness continues to be a major issue in NYC. What initiatives are being pursued to provide both short-term and long-term solutions, particularly in addressing mental health services for the homeless? That's a great question. So, first of all, I think that, uh, I believe that 90% of homeless people need mental, uh, uh, have mental health uh, problems. So, you know, creating those shelters, first of all, why are we creating shelters? Why are you building shelters in a nice, wealthy neighborhoods? Why we are, you know, making the lives of these people problematic? Why we're dropping the cost of the houses in these neighborhoods? Ask any person if they want to have a homeless shelter next to their house. I doubt anyone would say yes. Absolutely not. So, uh, first of all, I think those shelters have to have to be built in the industrial neighborhoods. Secondly, I strongly believe that uh, uh, shelters have to provide mental uh, mental health. I understand it's not easy. It's not simple. But this is the only way to uh, cure this this problem. Uh, and we need to treat homeless people with respect. But at the same time, we have to understand these people are mentally sick. At least, at least ninety percent of them. Maybe even maybe even ninety five. And we have to try to help these people, not just giving this, them temporary uh, shelter for one night. We need to cure these people. We need to try to help these people, but not making uh, other people's lives miserable when we are doing that. So we need a totally different approach to that problem other than the approach that we have right now. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. It simply doesn't work. Crime, particularly gun violence, has been a growing concern in NYC. 
What is your stance on gun control, and what measures are being taken at the state level to address the issue? It's people who shoot, it's not guns. People shoot guns. Guns don't shoot by themselves. And, uh, you know, when we see those signs, let's say some areas of the city or like Times Square, no gun zone. I'm just laughing at it because who is this sign for? Who is this sign created for? For a person who has a legal weapon? A uh, person who has a legal weapon, I don't think this person would walk with a legal weapon on the, on the street, you know? And legal weapons don't cause problems. It's illegal ones. But for illegal weapon carriers, illegal arms, this sign doesn't mean anything. They're carrying illegal weapon anyway, or illegal gun, whatever. So why they should follow any signs or any rules or any regulations? Signs, rules, and regulations are created for people who follow the rules. And the guns we have a problem with are owned by people who don't follow the rules. So, um, I strongly believe that, you know, uh, the, let's say public schools, there's a policy that uh, school police doesn't have guns. I totally disagree with that. I think that school police are the first who has to have guns. Because imagine if the person with the illegal weapon comes to the school and there's no, no one to stop him. How you can stop a person with a gun without having one, right?